Okay, so we're going to start a session on delivering AI research at speed using serverless and Kubernetes. I'm joined here by Yus Noppen, senior researcher at BT. And we actually first got talking to each other probably in April 2018. And I had an email from Yus who was very excited. He said, I've been using your project OpenFAS, which is serverless on Kubernetes, for seven months. We've been experimenting with it, and I want to let you know what we've been doing. And one thing led to another, and here we are today. So, used. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, sounds about right. Uh, my name is indeed Joost Noppen. It's a Dutch name. Uh, rhymes on toast, so if you don't know how to pronounce that, call me anything bread-related. I will respond to it. And indeed, um, we got in touch with Alex um, about April last year. Um, and this essentially started with the point that within BT, uh, we have a research department. And this research department, well, BT does a lot of research. If you would ask people, what does BT do? Typically, people will say, broadband and phones, right? That's what we do. That's what we make our money with, which is absolutely fine. That is true. Um, but BT research essentially tries to look at what can BT become in the future. And there's research going on in machine learning and looking at big data, pretty much looking at our customer journeys, trying to find out what the typical pain points are, where our networks might fail, all that kind of stuff. Um, some other topics, cyber defense, can we automatically detect um, all kinds of dangers on our network? Can we forecast where our network will be in most in demand during a particular time of day? Um, a lot of stuff happening, and all of this pr produces software. Right? All our researchers typically produce some kind of AI algorithm, and those AI algorithms then in turn need to be turned into products that can be used by our end users, which can be customers, can be our own development teams, can literally be, be anyone uh, that is related to our organization. You need to come a bit closer. Am I, am I out of range? Yes. There we go. Now, this created a challenge for us, right? And this was all pre-OpenVAS and serverless. Um, the point was that we have our, uh, our researchers, and our researchers are typically data scientists who have excellent skills in mathematics and statistics and stuff like that, but not necessarily a whole lot of skills in hardcore software engineering and productizing bits of software. We also had a bit of an issue with, inside our research department when it comes to using CI and CD. And there wasn't a lot of that happening, which is not great. Um, and we increasingly were targeting as the output um, stuff being deployed onto an external cloud environment like Amazon or something like that. So there was a lot of friction here. And that was combined. I will move a bit more over here. Yes. Moved a bit too fast there, with a number of constraints that go on top because they are specific to our organization. Uh, constraints such as if we are dealing with customer confidential data, um, we need to deploy on premises, we need to have control, and it's due to all kinds of legislative constraints. Um, we have to have some level of enterprise control, we have to have some kind of auditability of the way where our data goes, how it gets deployed, and who gets access. So, those things made our life hard. And typically, we ended up with this kind of de uh, development model for our research. At the left top, we have our fantastically intelligent data scientists who do stuff that I really don't understand. They come up with an algorithm represented by the delta that you can see up there. And that algorithm was then placed into a proof of concept tool. Right? It would effectively be something that you can demonstrate to the management team that would create or demonstrate value and then convince people that this needs to be taken further. And that taken further is the step going down. We would hand over our proof of concept algorithm to a development team. That development team would completely re-implement everything from scratch. And in the space of, oh, say, two to three years, you would have a product that ideally would do what the original did, but in practice, maybe not so much. Uh, but it was perhaps secure, and it would scale. So you used, would you say that that was what, you know, were the silos broken down? Was everybody working together? How, how easy was it to get updates to that application very, after it had been yeah. handed over? Excellent question. It was very, very hard. The, the, um, the cycle we have here, as most of you will have realized, is, is waterfall, effectively. Okay. You would go one cycle, and after three years, if the researcher then said, hang on, I had an update to my algorithm, the cycle would start again. And the updates, as you referred to, would take 
well, multiple years to get into this new product, if they would make it in at all. So very much suboptimal, yeah. So <laughs> BT was not happy with that, as you can imagine. And about a year and a half ago, we started the journey of identifying where the core problem lies. And I've already mentioned this. We had a range of expertise in our organization, and this is quite typical for big organizations, where you have people who specialize in one area, and then they have to collaborate with another area, and they don't know all the specifics. So our data scientists on the left, which we refer to as citizen developers, people whose day job is not software development, and yet they produce software, they would typically use something like R, Jupyter Notebooks with Interactive Python. Some of them even might use Java. And on the other side of the equation, to get to this point of rapid deployment and making things available to our end users and other researchers, you would have our expert developers who would use things like uh, Jenkins and uh, Git and all that kind of good stuff that we kind of take for granted. And this skill gap is considerable. It is really hard to convince people to skill up when their day job already is hard enough producing those, uh, those AI algorithms. I wonder if we could ask people in the audience if you, if you feel like you're identifying more like you're on this side or, or that side. Yeah, pretty much yeah, everybody. Maybe. So, you know, it's very hard for, even for me to relate and perhaps for you as well to what it is actually like to not know what kubectl or kubectl or whatever it's called actually is or how to get a harness on these tools. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with OpenFAS is just make that so easy that as a regular developer, you can come along and get an endpoint for your code. And you feel free to take photos. None of this is confidential. It's all recorded as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, to be clear, I identify myself on, on that right side of the slide as well. But given that I have to support the people on the left side, I can't get away with, oh, just learn how it works. How, how hard is it? If you're facing with so many people, that's too much, too much time, too much effort. So um, this was the model that, that we came up with. And there's nothing shocking here. This is effectively what most of the people in this room will say, yeah, that makes sense. Why didn't you do that before? Our idea was that instead of our researchers producing a proof of concept prototype that lives on their laptop and then hand it over to a development team, we would say, write your AI algorithm and then deploy it as a serverless function, a microservice. And at that point, your work becomes available to the entire organization instantly on a web endpoint. And we can start building all kinds of applications that use these, uh, these functionalities, share these functionalities even, so uh, better use of our resources, and then create some web front ends. And that will, will help speed things up. That was the plan. And to support this, we pretty much instantly uh, move towards OpenVAS as, as a solution. Right? It is a perfect way of packaging up your research algorithms and making them available. It ticks all those boxes. And the one problem that we needed to solve is our data scientists um, really need to have a almost zero touch deployment of their AI algorithms. So we came up with this particular workflow. At the left top, we would ask our data scientists to, you can use any language you want. We honestly don't care, right? We're gonna deploy it in, in Docker containers, so that is fine. And all that we ask of you is to effectively provide us with a textual description, a YAML file. And this YAML file contains the minimum details that are required to package this into an open VAS serverless function. So after we have that from our developers, that goes through a build pipeline, which can be Jenkins or GitLab or whatever the preferred flavor is in that case, it gets sent off following arrow one and then arrow two to a, to a web endpoint that sends it on to our deployment layer. And this essentially is a bit of smartness on our side, we'd like to think, that packages everything up into an, a serverless function and pushes the resulting container that contains this, um, this research algorithm into the harbor image registry. So we have our research algorithm neatly packaged up in a registry. And the final bit is asking our OpenVAS instance that you can so prominently see here in the middle to please deploy this function on the specified endpoint. So research algorithm goes through this packaging process, gets deployed on OpenVAS, and Bob's your uncle, literally. And this process takes around about 12, 15 seconds, as you can imagine. You have some other components there. You know, I can't take all, we can't take all the credit. I'd love to. But what, what other stuff are you using there that, from the cloud-native landscape? 
Um, well, you can see on, the, on this slide, we have the very obvious uh, Kubernetes cluster running this. This is our own managed uh, cluster. And just to highlight, we are a research team that pretty much experiments with bleeding edge Kubernetes. But that is our target, and that's also to make sure that moving forward, BT can acquire some of this new stuff and we can guarantee that it works. And we combine that with metrics collection using Prometheus. Um, that, that would already be the, the absolute basics, the minimum that, that we need. Um, okay. And We're going to see a dashboard a bit later on, aren't we, that you've used to get those Prometheus metrics together. Um, you've got to love a dashboard. Yeah, and, and we back this with Elasticsearch and Kibana and all that kind of stuff for data collection to make sure we have insight into what's happening to, and also to report back and say, look, all these researchers deploy their algorithms there and this is how many uses we get out of them. So the new life cycle then. This is the life cycle that we are currently using as compared to the old waterfall model that I showed you before. At the left top, we still have our researcher coming up with their fantastically bright ideas, developing that on their local machines and then using the pipeline that I showed you on the previous slide, um, that gets deployed onto the OpenFast gateway and becomes available to all our researchers. And this is the point where our development teams now get involved, but there's no need to re-implement this really difficult algorithm. Essentially, this is now a fully working deployment that can be scaled using OpenFast functionality. Um, and we built the app around that. So our development teams built the app, built the web front end, and it instantly becomes available. And there's a couple of differences there that are really important. The old life cycle would take three years to get the fully working application. And now the moment a researcher comes up with a bright idea, the reusable components, this research algorithm, instantly becomes available. And that typically can be done in the space of a couple of months. What we also get is these applications can now do far more reuse. It is a lot easier to build on top of existing research, as opposed to dealing with this, it lives in a laptop somewhere, not in a language I want. How do I deal with this? So one of the ways you may reuse those components is using something that OpenFast provides called the function store, where any one of these beta, alpha, and, and gamma functions could be put into a store, and anyone in your team can pull them in dynamically with the CLI. But something that I was, um, that wasn't expecting to hear about was how much of a process change this led to. So changing the software now meant that, I think you were telling me, the, um, the researchers were now inputting into the application, even making code contributions. Whereas before, in the old model, you having to get all the way to the end, have the developers take it on. And now you have these researchers inputting. That is, that is absolutely true. In, in, as I mentioned on the, on the, on the old uh, life cycle, the research was out of the loop the moment they handed it over. And now we have these feedback cycles. So our researcher can instantly feed back on how they like the application, uh, whether the algorithm is performing correctly. Um, they can make contributions. And we've observed when we applied this model that we started upskilling researchers because they saw how this process worked and they wanted to know how they could improve their own development practice. So in a way, enabling them to eat more easily share also made them appreciate more how this kind of process can help them out. So yeah, absolutely. And to stress, uh, the main benefit that we were after and that we got is this delivery time. If our researcher makes an update to the research algorithm, that will instantly go into the store, or into the, uh, the serverless endpoint, and it will be available in your application. So there isn't this three-year lag for things to make it in, into uh, production, which is a massive improvement. That actually is a, is a game changer for us. So a um, benefit that I would like to highlight as well, um, I've already mentioned internally, we run this on our own Kubernetes cluster, and we're very happy with that. But every now and again, when we are developing applications, quite frequently actually, uh, we work with customers who want to do a trial. And the trial is not necessarily a full performance trial, but maybe some functional feedback, just seeing if the tool actually works for them the way they want it to. In which case, we quite typically don't have access to an external Kubernetes cluster or even can justify the cost for that. And this is where OpenVAST offer, offers us that other additional benefit. It is built on industry standard core technologies. It is all Docker and, and coordination and Kubernetes. Um, Docker. But so you have a Docker image yeah. with port 8080. That's the primitive. I'll explain that a little bit later on. And what that means is that Yeast, when he will deploy this for a customer, can effectively shrink wrap it and generate a Docker Compose file and bypass all of Kubernetes. Now, there's some technology like K3S that makes it very easy to get a small Kubernetes cluster up and running with. Maybe some of you have tried it already. But one thing you also get here is pretty much 
the portability, that promise of Docker images is there. So even if you don't have an orchestrator, you can still put these together and get a lot of value from it. And then when you go to production, what's that like in comparison? Uh, going to production is fairly straightforward. Uh, either internally, we get a production Kubernetes cluster, which uh, BT has been working hard on to make easily available, or we will acquire some kind of Kubernetes instance from a cloud provider, and then it's just a matter of transferring it across using uh, production scripts that we have for that. So again, it's, it, it, it really improved our workflow on this, where it used to be really hard. And I'm not joking, sometimes this transfer would take up to two years in, uh, under the old model, going from one environment to another, and now it is 10 minutes and a cup of coffee, effectively, which um, I like coffee, so that's definitely good for me. So that is, say, the, uh, the slideware, uh, and we would like to highlight that by giving you a demonstration of um, how we apply this model in active working research. So we have an, an innovation center in Belfast, in Ireland. It's called BTIC, the BT Ireland Innovation Center, where there's in-depth collaboration with Ulster University and our uh, Belfast development teams. And the idea is that researchers there try to look at, among other things, ways to improve the life of software engineers. And the main thing that we're looking at at this point in time is some kind of risk assessment of new code coming into a repository. Um, bug prediction, if you want, or the likeliness of a bug occurring in the new bit of code. Um, and the reason that we have as follows, quite typically what you find is if particular metrics are high, there's a higher chance that that code will contain a bug. Cyclomatic complexity is an excellent example. If that goes up, the code is harder to understand, so it is more likely to contain a bug. And because we collect so much information about our code, we have Git repositories or subversion repositories, and we have Bugzilla, et cetera, so we have all the labeled data that allows us to do a correlation model between these two things. The particular height of a metric in the history of the project and whether a bug occurred in that bit of code for this particular team. Intuitively, if a team quite regularly has bugs in classes with high cyclomatic complexity, it's likely to happen again. So that is the model there, that is the research. Um, how you create these regression models, that is the current active research. The bit in the middle was the first research contribution. That is, we want to have some kind of configurable pipeline that allows us to collect the metrics that we think are the most important. And at this point, we didn't really know which ones were important, so it had to be very configurable. And that first research contribution was implemented using this new model and delivered within a space of about three months. So we had the first bit of um, analysis already in place. That got handed over to our, to our researchers for these regression models, speeding things up, but it was also already handed over to our development teams to experiment with. So not three years, three months, and we got feedback from the development team and the researchers. And I'll, I'll show to you what this tool currently looks like. So Alex, if I could use you as a microphone stand for a sec. There we go. Uh, the ga yeah. glamorous life of an international speaker. Here we go. Do you want me to switch over yeah. to Zoom? There we go. Here we are. So, as you can see here, this is a repository analyzer. This is the thing that collects all the metrics and renders them out on screen. And this allows us to provide a URL of any repository we want to analyze with a username and password if we happen to have one of those. So let's start with a fairly simple one. This is a repository that contains a little bit of Go and a little bit of Java. So this will run for a couple of seconds, hopefully not that long. There we go. And then it comes back with all the metrics that it could collect. Right? So can it ran through about 12 or 13 serverless functions. Can we make it any bigger? Uh, yes, we can, absolutely. So this is data mining. You've heard of some companies stealing your data. Well, this is our own data, or BT's data, and they want to get more value out of it. Yeah. Who would have thought you could go back to subversion and do archaeology and get information that will help you for today? Absolutely. And, and you can see here is it collects basic things like the number of lines of code in a repository and which languages with some, some nice charts. But this is not necessarily the most interesting bit. It's when you start looking at things like hotspots. Which files are the most frequently changed? Those files are more likely to have bugs intuitively because they have more changes. Um, perhaps more interestingly, things like complexity, uh, how many spaces on average are used. Spaces are a good indicator of indentation. The more indentation you have, the more levels of complexity. And, and there you go. Um, coupling is an interesting one as well. Let me see if I can go down a little bit. So the graph that we have here 
essentially renders out how often two elements in a repository are committed at the same time. So for every single element here, we calculate a value. So in this case, we can see that these two elements are committed at the same time, 11% of the time. So not such a strong link, but if that number goes up, if one has a bug or is likely to have a bug, that will aggregate very likely across as well. So that's interpreting um, the commit history and aggregating that into numbers. Ownership then is an interesting one as well, where we look at, for each file, who is the most prominent contributor, who is the owner of that particular thing, and that will help us to, uh, to work out um, risk factors or non-risk factors. And these are presumably the metrics that are the most interesting for these kind of analyses, where you have things like method length right here, uh, or cyclomatic complexity, and the higher this number is, the, uh, and the more likely that bugs will occur. So uh, I, I've got an idea, actually. Um, should we have a look at something in OpenFAS and see what the quality is like? That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> Why not? What and should we see. pick? Um, oh, we could pick the watchdog. Well, I, I, We're going to talk I, about that in a minute. That's so, true. It's also conveniently yeah. already in the list of previously analyzed repositories, which is, um, is good. All right, so when we run the analysis, and now it effectively does exactly the same thing, whether it's on-site or off-site, it, it, it will do that perfectly fine. And you can see here when we look at cyclomatic complexity in OF Watchdog, there are a couple of files that might need a bit of attention. And again, this is not an indicator that there are bugs. This is just a case of it's more likely to contain bugs than, than any other file. It seems to be Protobuf and Prometheus. What a surprise. Um, when, when we look at ownership, it also will come as no surprise that um, uh, Alex is by far and away the most active uh, contributor to this particular project, which makes pretty busy there. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely. right. Um, and I think one of the nice things I want to highlight as well is that this is a great example of how this continuous updating really helps. We started out with just having support for Java metrics and SVN, because SVN is what BT used to do. And adding Git support and had, adding Go metric support was a space of, I think, about half an hour before that made it from our own desktop uh, implementing that to having it in the hands of our researchers and our development teams. So it's that kind of speed of delivery that really makes a difference for us. Show, me what, show them what you showed me with the README file, because I, I thought that was kind of interesting, actually. Which one was that? The um, hotspots? Yeah, the, the hotspot, so I think, is interesting. What do you think of this? The README has been updated 21 times, and the main go about 19, which means every time we're changing the code, we're changing it significantly enough that we should update the README. Now, this could be a tool a manager could use to bash developers over the head. You're changing the code and not updating the documentation. Perhaps you could automate that and track that over time. Right, so we go beyond static analysis and start binding these yeah. relationships together. And I think another thing that's also nice to see is that there's a very fast fall off. So you have a um, high number of revisions on the main file, which is your, your main controller. That is perfectly acceptable. All the others are fairly nicely isolated. They don't change very much because they already do what they need to do, and they're absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, th th this pretty much is, uh, is a good example of how this changed the way that, that we worked in BT using OpenVAS. And, and this seems like a good time to explain a little bit about what OpenVAS does and how OpenVAS achieves all this stuff yeah. that we kind of take for granted at this point in BT. Well, yeah, I'm going to tell you a bit more about OpenVAS, but let's give you a round of applause for that demo. Thank you. It was really, really well done. So. I don't know what your experience is like with serverless, but there's actually this landscape that's been put together because there's so many serverless projects that it got out of hand. We had to build our own landscape. There's also a dichotomy here that on the left-hand side, we have these proprietary frameworks that are very much locked in. And it may be okay for you if you're an Amazon customer, but you don't have much control. On the other side of the screen, Things can be a bit harder. You have to set stuff up yourself, but you get full control. Now, if we look into this a bit more, a serverless 1.0 framework or product, let's say, if you're an Amazon customer, you're going to need to use Lambda. There's just no other tool for you if you want to integrate with the billing and the support agreement that you've got set up. Lambda has its own set of limitations and characteristics and availability regions, its own timeout. I think we found that some people have heard that you can run for 15 minutes if you're using an event, but through the API gateway, last time we looked, it was 30 seconds. That might be a bit restrictive for you. The zip file is very specific, and so is the signature. In a serverless working group of the CNCF, we tried to see 
if we could consolidate around the function signature, and it turned out it was just too hard, we ended up creating a project called Cloud Events. Now, as a GCP customer, you've got a completely different set of CLI tools, a different IAM, different constraints, different maximum and minimum um, availability. And then we get to the enterprise where use comes into the picture, and he's got microservices as well. Now, we know that we, we can't just rewrite everything from scratch. We need to lift and shift. So it leaves a big question mark for us, serverless 1.0. And I want to introduce you to this concept of serverless 2.0. Please feel free to take a picture of this because I think it's going to be significant. The idea is we have a much simpler stack where it's not just functions. Microservices are fair game. Docker is a packaging format, and we just expose traffic on port 8080, and that's all we need to do. The platform is Kubernetes, and then, as we know, Kubernetes runs almost on any cloud, even at the edge. So I put together Serverless Landscape 2.0, and we heard Oracle talk about big tent mentality in the keynote. Well, I believe that OpenFAS, Knative, and the projects from Azure are all pretty much on the same playing field right now where we're targeting a Docker image. There are other projects that, that are in this space, but they don't target a Docker image. First thing you need is you need a build template. This takes your source code and produces a Docker image at the end of it. And there's various options available. You then need somewhere to run it. Just has picked OpenFAS, but Knative is an alternative that's coming out of Google. Once you have that, you then need a platform. Kubernetes and OpenShift are pretty much equivalent. And on the right-hand side, we have things that are interesting, but not necessarily essential for every customer. We've got eventing. Kader is a new project from Azure that allows you to scale based upon the depth of the queue. Kind of an interesting approach. Scale from zero. If you use something like Knative right now, we're looking at sort of seven to nine seconds for a cold start. Might be acceptable. I don't, I don't know your use case. With OpenFAS leveraging Kubernetes, we're at about two to two and a half seconds. And I hope that we can get that down as a community as we continue to work on these problems. Now, the other, the other interesting thing about this is that there was that dichotomy of managed and non-managed. Well, now you can actually take these Docker images and run them on managed platforms like Cloud Run, OpenFAS Cloud and Azure functions. And so we're really getting the best of both worlds in serverless 2.0. Now, the key properties of serverless functions made simple, this is the tagline of OpenFAS, is that you can run your code anywhere you want, even on an ARM device or at the edge. You can have any code, functions, microservices, even regular binaries. I showed a demo at the serverless summit of the tool dig that we were using to debug a DNS issue, and I've made it into a function with a HTTP API that was highly scalable, right? Now, we also get scale to zero, but also the, the capacity of the cloud if we want it. Ed, one of our contributors, showed us how we can deploy OpenFAS both to Kubernetes and Lambda and burst out to one or the other, depending on what characteristics we need. There's a lot of exciting things we can do when Kubernetes gives us that power. Now, I'll show you a demo of the OpenFAS ecosystem so you can kind of get an idea of how this all works. First of all, we'll take a look at the function store, which is how in OpenFAS we can discover functions. So I set this up earlier today, and We've got the OpenFAS portal in UI. When I click the function store button, we'll see a whole bunch of images that are pre-canned from the community. Many of these are actually machine learning. And we can do all sorts of things like colorized pictures. Um, one of the things I'll show you very quickly is the ability to figure out what is in an image. And what we did is package the Inception or ImageNet catalog. And I'll look for a picture of a, let's find something like a kitten. And as long as this isn't an encrypted URL, which I believe that one might be. So this is from Unsplash. We can paste in the body and hit invoke. This will spin round, and then we get a prediction come back that this is a tabby cat. 
and this took us zero. This is like 50% short, to one second. Now we can also run this asynchronously in open, in open files by running it in the background. I think we're here for 35 minutes, is that correct? Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do now is to show you the template store very quickly. You can find out about open files online but you can't find out so much about the BT use case, so we'll focus on BT. This is a function store. If I do fast CLI store list, we get all of the programming languages that the community have built and that we're supporting, but also other people have submitted, like Rust. And Rust is very popular at the moment. So if I want to create a new Rust function, I just do fast CLI template store pull and type in Rust. This actually comes from a Git repo, so it's all standard things. And then I can do fast CLI new language Rust, call it uh, Rusty function. From there, I then get a nice cargo file. And my, my handlers, you know, Rust is pretty lean. That's absolutely tiny. But then let's say you had a microservice. You can use um, the Docker file template. So we pull in all of our standard templates. And now we can start something up with a Docker file and call it, for instance, dig, like my example. And then we'll find in the dig folder a Docker file where there's a process that will run for every invocation this line here, F process, and now I can run fast CLI up and I'll have an endpoint within a few seconds. So it's really that simple. So whether you've got a programming language that we've already made available, one that you're using at work and you want to access, or anything else, um, it's all available from, from a CLI very, very quickly. I'll tell you a bit about the OpenFAS architecture. As we have run over time, uh, we're running out of time, but a lot of this information is available online. You can also follow through our workshop. The way things work is we've got a command line that you just saw, the UI that you saw, but also a RESTful API, so it's programmatic. If you want to use a Kubernetes CRD, you can also do that. The OpenFAS gateway exposes a CRUD interface and invoke. So when you create a function, it will go to a component called a provider, this is modular, we have a Kubernetes one, and that will go and create a function. Turns out we get a service and a deployment, which will then go off and create our pod so we can invoke our function. Red metrics, rate, error, and duration are collected through Prometheus, and that allows us to auto-scale and also to scale to zero if needed. Now, because we have a RESTful API, you can also build your own auto-scaler if you don't like ours or if you want to do something a bit more special. And that streaming is what allows us to run functions in the background, and that is built into the stack as well. This is one of the BT dashboards, and you see all of the data bubbling up from their systems. Now, if, you, if you've heard of OpenFAS or used it before, you may know of the watchdog. That was the original component that I created that would allow us to take a HTTP request, read it into memory, and then fork a process and use standard in and standard out Unix pipes to make that a HTTP server without that having any knowledge of that stack. It could be 25 years old or older. The response of that is then marshaled back. Now this is great because any binary works, but we created a new version that BT are using, and this has very high throughput. Instead, we fork your process, but you need to expose HTTP in your language. What that allows us to do is have very, very fast throughput and a standard shim that can implement all of the health checks and metrics that you don't need to care about. OpenFAS also has access to events and they're very easy to use. If you install an event connector, the only thing you need to do after that is to put an annotation on your function with what topic it cares about and it'll be invoked automatically. So, through this work, we've actually gained some feedback. One of the ways we did that is through community briefings. So I would invite all of the OpenFAS users, any OpenFAS users here? I know there's 
There's quite a few in the room. Thank you for attending. So you may have been on one of these Zoom calls, and it's great to just see where people are at, um, get introductions, and find out what problems they're working on. With BT, we worked through a number of pain points, and they were things like where BT were putting huge load into a function and cancelling it midway, and we'd never really tried that. It turned out there was a problem with the way the Go um, net HTTP client worked, and we were able to optimize that in a couple of weeks, and other end users benefited from it. Other ways that they've got involved is by telling us more about their project goals and aims and being able to align where it made sense. And then also working through GitHub issues, there was a small swagger problem. Um, always update your documentation. Maybe we should use your tool. And Use was able to let us know about that. So really, as we just finish up, um, perhaps we can just say what the impact was to BT. Well, for BT, there was significant impact, if only for the fact that this is one of the first times we've engaged with an open source project in, in this way. Um, and it has taught us a lot about, well, first of all, how OpenFast works and how it technically all fits together, um, but also how you uh, practice open source, how you engage with it as, as a company, and how you can have a mutually beneficial relationship out of this. Um, it also forced us to rethink how we deliver software. We were already aware that our CI CD wasn't great, and only by engaging with best in class, you work out this is the, uh, the road ahead. This, this has to be our agenda. Um, I've already mentioned one of the things that actually came out of this as well is that um, we redefined almost the role of our citizen developers, of our data scientists. It was an organizational change happening because of engaging with an open source project. It allowed the, uh, the research to do what they're good at and still get good software engineering practice out of them. And even that is still percolating down because we are now deliberately considering research software engineers as a role that are the in-between. They are specialists in data science, but they also know enough of software engineering to lead a team of data scientists in everything that they want to learn. So a big impact on the organization. Thank you. So we have some future work, but we've run out of time now. I appreciate you staying a bit, little bit longer. So thank you so much for being a great audience. If you'd like to find out more, we've got the PDF uploaded online, and you can join our Slack community where you have a chance to participate in the project or learn more.